Hello, and welcome to Stanford's Earth Day Future 50 event, recognizing the 50th anniversary of the original Earth Day. I'm Chris Field, the director of Stanford's Woods Institute for the Environment, and I'm so pleased that you've chosen to join us today. Today's event is one of several that Stanford is coordinating this week, and is one of literally thousands around the world. In this time of social distancing, it's an inspiration to see people reaching out to connect on issues they care about. For today's event, we have over 1,500 registrations. Our community may be dispersed at the moment, but that doesn't mean it's small or that it lacks commitment. Our plan for today is to combine looking forward and looking forward. We'll spend a little more time on the setting and aspirations in 1970, looking forward from there. And we'll have a conversation with young environmental leaders looking forward from today. We're thrilled to bookend today's sessions with remarks from Dennis Hayes, organizer of the first Earth Day, and Mark Tessier-Levine, the president of Stanford University. In between, we'll have the chance to hear from all of you, engaging you and your questions in conversation mode. We're in a uniquely challenging time, sheltering in place while trying to find a way to open the economy. At the same time, we face profound threats to Earth's sustainability from biodiversity to climate change to ocean pollution. Today, in addition to challenges, we also have real opportunities to learn from the pandemic and to rethink the relationship between humans and nature. For me, there are two central lessons I've already taken from our experience with the pandemic. The first is that we truly are a global community. Pandemics don't pay attention to national borders or differences in income, ethnicity, or culture. They also highlight the importance of interactions between humans and wildlife. The second important lesson from the pandemic is the value of incorporating science and other forms of expertise in building strong policy, including a strong commitment to investing in preparation before we encounter a looming disaster. Thank you so much for joining us today. Next up, we have an interview with Dennis Hayes with an embedded introduction. It's an amazing pleasure for me today to be able to share a few minutes in conversation with Dennis Hayes. Dennis was the principal organizer of the first Earth Day in 1970. He led the effort to take the event international in 1990 and has been a, a genuine hero for the planet over the last five decades. Uh, Dennis is currently the president and CEO of the, of the Bullet Foundation his work has been widely recognized, among other recognitions. He's won the Rachel Carson Medal, Time Magazine's Heroes of the Planet, and, uh, and many, many others. He also has a strong Stanford connection, and Dennis has both undergraduate and law degrees from Stanford. While he was at Stanford, he was president of the student body. I feel incredibly fortunate to have a chance to visit with him about the impacts of Earth Day and the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And let me start, Dennis Hayes, by thanking you so much for five decades of environmental leadership. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, for that overly generous introduction. It, 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 there's an ironic thing to the Stanford connection. I, I got an undergraduate degree, but I, I also went to law school, to business school. I taught engineering for five years. I taught human biology for one year. I was, as you said, the student body president. I also served on the board of trustees. When I left Stanford, I went to Harvard for two months and dropped out to organize Earth Day. And basically, to the extent that anyone has heard anything about my educational background, it is that I dropped out of Harvard. <laughs> so I have a two-month connection to go to Earth Day. Well, we're very proud of the Stanford connection. And I think... Uh, that your influence on Stanford has been very positive, and I hope that Stanford's influence on you has also been a positive one. Very much a turning point in my life. Let's talk a little bit about that first Earth Day. Um, tell us about what led up to it and led up to your willingness to take on the mantle. Well, after my sophomore year, I, I went, I, I, I had gone through the experience that higher education and the best instances does, and that it completely shredded everything that I thought that I knew about my country, its governance system, the way that its laws functioned. It shredded my religions, it shredded everything. And I was this destroyed mess out looking at different social and political and cultural systems around the world, trying to find things that I really 
liked and respected. I had taken a course in ecology, um, but it was basically studying dragonflies. And although we read Odom, I, I hadn't applied it to much beyond the, the coursework. Um, but one night in, in Namibia, uh, for some reason, this whole thing came together with me and I realized the fundamental truth that humans are animals and that all animals need to be paying attention to the basic principles of ecology. We had managed to uh, ignore many of them because we could tap into fossil fuels, which is a governing factor for much of the rest of the science. But began to question what would happen if, if we began to, I mean, there was no vocabulary then for human ecology or industrial ecology or urban ecology, but I began to think in what would be described in those terms. Now, got up the following morning knowing that I wanted to devote my life, probably academically, to those sorts of pursuits and came back. So that's why I was interested in doing this. The background for it is that uh, at a time when the war was raging in Southeast Asia and civil rights was a, a big and important and vibrant and, and uh, how should I say, uh, disruptive influence in the wake of the death of Martin Luther King and uh, some serious urban riots across the United States, a senator from Wisconsin had the sense that, that there was a ripening concern for environmental issues across the country that might be tapped into. And his idea was to go back as we did in the early stages of the war and have teach-ins on college campuses. With regard to the war, that was the people that thought that it was a domino effect. If Vietnam fell, then Laos would fall, Cambodia would fall, Burma would fall, Thailand would fall. Versus those that believed it was a colonial situation where China had dominated Vietnam and then France had come in and then Japan had come in and then France had come back and now the United States was going in. But there was a genuine debatable issue up on stage that helped to create and focus attention on a war that at that point was escalating. So um, Gaylord went around giving speeches about this. I saw an account of one of them in the New York Times. I hadn't heard anything about this teaching at Harvard. I was brand new there, seemed to tie into what I wanted to do with my life. And with all of the arrogance of youth, I flew down to Washington, DC, got a 15 minute courtesy interview and it turned out he didn't have anybody organizing Harvard or Cambridge or Boston or Massachusetts or New England. He was giving speeches and thought it was a good idea. So it, it turned into a couple of hour chat. I went back with the charter to organize Boston. Two days later, I had a call saying, would you drop out and come down to organize the United States? <laughs> that, well, that's wow. a lot more than fun than what I'm doing. It's what I want to be doing with my life. And uh, it kind of shifted me off of an academic course and uh, more into an activist course. And did you realize as the first Earth Day approach that it had the potential to go as big as it finally went? No, we thought it had the potential to go big, but big in those days would be big like the March on the Pentagon, big like the Vietnam Moratorium, March on Selma. Um, what was different between Earth Day and all of those other things, and what was really quite remarkable in an era where there were no cell phones, there was no internet, no computers, no social media, was that we managed to, man to penetrate basically every large city, every town, every village, I think almost every crossroads in the United States. It was vastly larger than any other event that had taken place. Uh, there was, you know, somebody set out to organize it and have it happen. It wasn't bigger than Victory in Europe Day, where you had spontaneous things everywhere. But the 20 million people were estimated by the wire services to have participated in we certainly didn't expect that. I, I was, went as part of my bouncing around the country on Earth Day to an event on Fifth Avenue in New York, where Mayor Lindsay had blocked out more than 40 blocks of Fifth Avenue for this thing, climbed up on a stadium, was looking out over a crowd that was later estimated to being roughly a million people. And it was people on over the sight horizon, I mean, people farther than you could see from a platform that was 60 or 70 feet in the air. That was the first time that I realized, my God, this is huge and potentially powerful. And it, it reflects the right event at the right time. And that leads me to ask, sort of, what do we need in order to re-energize the environment movement in 2020? Well, there's a, a degree of revitalization that is taking place has been for a couple of years with the student climate strikes. Uh, they are not always 
hugely sophisticated and their policy answers are pretty vague, but it has that passionate commitment that gets people's attention. It unfortunately is by people who are not old enough to vote and, and those who are old enough to vote tend to have poor turnout rates. But it's got the roots of something that I think can be very important and in putting together what was our initial intent for Earth Day in 2020. We they paid special attention to getting all of these youth groups, the Greta, but also the, uh, the 60 or 70 other national and international student climate strikers around the world. Um, other things are putting a human face on it. it it's like COVID-19. Uh, when I was in China, we had a tough time taking it very seriously in the United States. I, I'm in Seattle, America's Wuhan, where I sort of first lit. And, you know, there's a few people who are all 85, 90 years old in a retirement community, and nobody here took it very seriously until suddenly it was spreading and we knew someone or we were one person removed from someone who had it. And that seemed to, I mean, it then emerged into something that became a gigantic issue. The, and the, the nice thing about it versus environmental issues is like, nice from an organizing standpoint is that um, it's clear it, it, we've identified the virus. We know where it came from. We know how it operates within the body and it, it, it's all crystal clear. We've always had hurricanes and droughts and floods and um, typhoons and uh, the, the, the things that are affecting us in, in the climate regime are a little bit less easy to communicate broadly to an audience that, that, that this is clear and you should be taking it very seriously because like COVID-19, it starts small and then suddenly passes a tipping point and, and you're in real trouble. And I, I'm not sure how to communicate that. that I'm, I'm, I'm like a person who did one thing well and then just decided to keep doing it. And my aspirations this year and what I thought we were going to do was to have massive crowds, crowds of anywhere from 250,000 to a million um, in places stretching from Germany to Brazil, uh, in India to St. Peter's Square in Rome, where Pope Francis had agreed to address a large crowd. We, we were going to be turning out, in our dreams at least, a billion people on Earth Day demanding bold action on climate. And that sort of thing, I think, does still work for political impact. Unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 turned out to be the ultimate black swan. Uh, two and a half years of, of organizing and literally everything that we set about to do was made illegal. I, I, I'd really like to ask another question about your vision for how social movements change the trajectory of the world. But I also want to ask a question about COVID-19. Maybe we can talk a little bit about what a billion voices could do for action on climate and and. Is it a billion voices speaking in unison to the global whole, or are the, are the responses things that need to be more targeted at particular companies, particular countries, particular houses of Congress? And, and I think all of the above. I think there's there's enormous value in targeting some companies that have done truly despicable things. Uh, the role that British Petroleum (BP) played in beating down the climate initiatives in Washington state, I think, for a company that continues to try to hold itself out as the green oil company, boy, it stripped its mask away. And then as somebody who once actually held a couple hundred shares of it in my retirement portfolio, I will now drive a mile out of my way to avoid a, a BP service station. And the same sort of thing goes for the financial interests that have been under financing the mountaintop removal and pipelines and fracking and what have you. Uh, but at the same time that that happens, I think it's necessary to have people be focusing on what their governments can do. And, and unlike many people in this field, I really want them to focus upon what they can do individually as well. If, if there's a lesson that we all should learn from a couple millennia of religions, it's that people believe things with more intensity and cling to it uh, with more tenacity when they actually have... Uh, done something themselves that is active toward that end. And uh, it's, it's everything from the religious sacraments of many faiths to what have you. We, in, a, in a sense, you can make the case that the sacramental element of recycling may be more important than the 
substance element of recycling, but yeah. getting people to do that. And, and with regard to climate, where everybody can make their house more efficient, everybody can choose the most efficient appliances, everybody can choose a better diet, everybody can choose a better automobile, and better yet, to figure out another way to get from here to there. Once you've got people making all of those changes, they are then committed to bringing society with them. And when they talk to their neighbors, they're speaking from a position of greater integrity. Their neighbors don't view them as hypocrites. Yeah, I, I, I think that the power of crowds and the power of engagement, the power of seeing that solutions are tangible, all fit together in a very compelling way. Let me close by just asking your thoughts about the really challenging situation we're in now with a global pandemic that's rearranging everything from plans for environmental activism to the global economy. And how do you think about uh, what needs to be learned from this event and what we can do in order to be most well positioned in order to take advantage of that learning? Hmm. That's a terrific question. And um, let, let me be uncharacteristically optimistic. Um, what, what can we learn? Well, one thing might be that, that regardless of what your ideological stance is, we are in a globally interconnected world now. And there are some things that once they happen in one place are going to spread. And that once they happen in one place, they have then immediate global implications. As you know better than anyone, it just makes no difference whether you burn a ton of coal in Germany or China or India or the United States. It's exactly the same thing. So you have to get the world cooperating on a solution. That's exactly what you've got with the pandemic. Uh, you can stomp it out in one country, but if you don't stomp it out across the planet, then you always have that chance of it surging back. Uh, so it's a place where there has been cooperation. My governor, we and I, I live in Seattle, Washington, uh, we got it first here, and we've managed to tamp down the curve pretty effectively. The governor of the state is taking 400 ventilators and sending them to New York because they need them more. We want to be cooperative, and we want to be helping them. And I, 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 you know, the loads of things that have been going back and forth from countries, between countries, that they've got something that another country really needs, and we're working cooperatively as a species. And it, I, I think... That's the big thing about these global threats. Uh, if we can come together and, and pursue the interests of, if you will, homo sapiens, as opposed to the interests of ultranationalism in um, Turkey or in the Philippines or in India or in the United States and, and view these global threats as true global threats. And if we can have something in our field, like the World Health Organization that uh, is got a little bit of power, but has a lot of persuasive ability. Um, and, and that when it says something, governments genuinely pay attention and generally toe the line. Uh, again, the United States occasionally being an exception in the current administration. Um, then, then I think that's just an enormous step in the right direction. Ultimately, I, I'm of the belief uh, that, that having dawdled now for too many decades and and produce some brilliant studies and some powerful conferences, but not very much action. I mean, we still produce more carbon dioxide every year than we did the year before, instead of less every year than the year before. Uh, we've now got to the point where we have to take some, some very bold actions. And that will happen only if we've got that kind of basis of huge public support that begins to demand it. So I, I, I think, perhaps unrealistically, that COVID-19 can be something that we can learn from in that regard. And uh, that would certainly be the best possible outcome for me as someone who's <laughs> seen a couple of years work just dashed by it. Uh, I'd, I'd be more than happy if, if what came out of it instead was a recognition that we are one planet and we've got to address these things as a planet. Yeah. Dennis Hayes, thank you so much. I don't think there's anyone who has made a bigger difference in generating public support for environmental issues than you. And I hope that we can come together in future years and see that the momentum from Earth Day really has carried on and that we're making real progress in some of the biggest challenges of our era. Thank you so much. Take care.
So I'm joined today by, by three really incredible young folks. The first is Ken Alston. He's the director of mobility and energy storage at New Energy Nexus and Cal CEF Ventures, both of which support clean energy entrepreneurs. Ken's an expert on clean energy entrepreneurship and financing. Prior to his current position, Ken was special advisor to the U.S. Secretary of Energy, where he co-founded DOE's Clean Energy Investment Center. His Stanford connections include an MBA and an MS from the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. Second guest is Molly Morse, who was the CEO and co-founder of Mango Materials, a San Francisco-based startup company that uses methane to manufacture biodegradable materials to serve as low-cost substitutes for plastic. Mango Materials has won numerous awards for innovation and sustainability. Molly is an expert in biopolymers and biocomposite engineering. Her Stanford PhD in civil and environmental engineering was on biodegradable composites for the building industry. And the third panelist is Tara Weeks, senior advisor to the chair of the California Energy Commission, David Hochschild, where she works on a wide variety of energy issues, including renewable energy integration, offshore wind development, building and industry electrification, and other efforts to reduce greenhouse emissions and achieve California's climate and energy targets. She has an MS in civil and environmental engineering for Stanford, and she was vice president of projects for the Stanford Energy Club. Ken, Molly, Tara, thank you so much. I look forward to uh, a few minutes of conversation. And let me just start off with Tara. Tell me what Earth Day means to you. Um, what does Earth Day mean to me? Um, you know, I think really it's, it's a time of year to take a pause um, and reflect. You know, I think a lot of us working in and around the clean tech community um, are so busy on a day-to-day -day basis that sometimes it's easy to kind of get lost in the weeds and lose sight of the big picture and why we're doing the work that we do. Um, and I know for me, you know, well, not now, but a typical day is, you know, really filled with meetings. Everything's kind of, you know, hurried. Um, and, you know, I got into this field because I love the environment. Um, I actually thought I was going to start a career in marine research and then really kind of pivoted to energy because I realized, you know, these are systemic problems and I really wanted to focus on solutions uh, more so than the problems. Um, but I think it is just a day to kind of zoom back out and think about that macro scale picture. And Molly, the idea of focusing on solutions is at the very core of starting a company to provide sustainable materials. Have you always been motivated by the sustainability aspect or by the company aspect? So with my case and my colleagues at Mango Materials, it actually has been from the sustainability standpoint from day one. A lot of us were actually motivated um, about the problem with plastic pollution or concerns about trash since we were in elementary school. So it's something that's gone back um, in our lives quite a distance. And so now that we're actually transforming this into a business, the biz you know, using business as a means for good is something that's come much later in life, but something that we're using in order to really focus on sustainability and address the problem with polluting plastics and climate change. And Ken, your job is to find people who want to build new companies in this space. And do you, what do you look for in terms of the kind of entrepreneur who can be successful in combining sustainability and a viable company? It's really been a pleasure, Chris, to um, be able to uh, approach the sustainability space from this perspective as an investor, getting to look at um, companies and really think through uh, taking examples that I've seen of what works and trying to help um, new companies that we're seeing start to um, you know, try to apply those, those lessons. I think there's a few things that we really um, start to look for. I mean, I think one is just the qualities of the team themselves um, having a passion for this, this space, um, sustainability, the product that they're trying to work on so that inherent qualities of the team um, are quite important. I think a second area that we we're really excited about is, is the market. We really see that the, the climate space is a tremendous opportunity for 
uh, continued growth. And that, I think that's something that we're talking about is we reflect on 50 years of Earth Day and looking forward. And I think third is just, you know, better understanding the underlying technology itself. And there's so much innovation that's taking place with, um, you know, really sharp entrepreneurs. So those are a few of the factors that we, we tend to look at. Yeah, thanks so much. Molly, let me follow up on that with a question about the size of the market. And with something like advanced new materials that are replacements for plastics, are you really thinking about tapping into a market demand that's already there? Or do you need to build the demand at the same time as you introduce new products? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are tapping into existing an existing demand. So plastics are all around us, a large part of our lives. The thing is the problem with the end of life, what happens to them when we're no longer, they're no longer needed and also how are they made? So in most cases, we're substituting a material that's already there. So there's already a demand for plastics. There's already in some unique cases, a concern about end of life. What's key to us is actually what markets do you start with? Because if you look at something like plastic bags or plastic water bottles, those materials are produced at very high volumes, at very low cost and very specific mechanical properties. So in terms of where are you going to start, for us, when we're still small scale, it's at, it's, it's, it's at very targeted specific applications. So finding those exact markets is, is tricky, but having that wide, large, you know, billions and billions of pounds or dollars worth of um, demand, it's already there. Tara, this brings up the issue of the regulatory environment and how the regulators can play a role in making sure that the market's there when the products are. And energy is a little different than plastics, but many of these same issues probably still apply that you need to make sure that the regulatory window opens when the product or mature? Oh, absolutely. Um, and at the Energy Commission, where I work, um, our R&D team um, has really been thinking through about how to cultivate a clean tech ecosystem, um, really fostering everything from lab, lab stage R&D uh, through commercialization, demonstration projects, pilot projects, um, to really commercially viable products across the um, you know, buildings, energy efficiency, transportation, renewables, energy storage. So really a wide uh, array of technologies. And that really supports um, basically a policy cycle. So we can, um, you know, establish policies to help seed markets, uh, help scale new technologies, which allow for further breakthroughs um, and can help us push policy further. And so really we kind of, you know, iterate through that cycle over and over, which has allowed us to, for instance, increase our renewable portfolio standard from 20% to now 100% out in 2045. Um, so it's really allowed us to just be as aggressive as possible in our policy making. And, and Ken, when you think about this changing policy landscape, particularly in a place like California, where Tara and her colleagues have been aggressive about changing the standards, do you, do you try to target investments that are going to be mature in a policy environment we don't have yet? Or do you try to track policy as it evolves? Well, I think that we're doing both, Chris. Um, we're very um, appreciative of the work that Tara and her colleagues do at the Energy Commission um, and, and across the policy landscape of really setting an aggressive set of targets for where, this, where the state is going to go. Uh, with clean energy technologies. Uh, I think uh, bills like SB 100, which was um, uh, passed um, in the last two years, have set a 100% clean energy vision for California that we're now seeing a number of other states um, start, to, start to take up. Um, and I think that how we look at this is that we really think that the country, um, you know, over time is going to start to see the benefits of moving to a clean energy economy. So I think we're doing both. We're looking at what are the policy targets that have been set, but we're also seeing that, you know, there are some states that may not have adopted this, but over time, uh, we, we're, really, we're very bullish in terms of these technologies getting uh, widespread approval, not, not just in places like California. Yeah. And, and Molly, when you look at the 
regulatory environment? Do you feel like you need to see changes in regulations in order to open the doorways to the products that you're producing? Or can you slide in simply based on consumer demand under the existing regulatory frameworks? So we can slide in with existing regulatory frameworks. However, the door would be open wider and faster if there were changes that were implemented. So if we look at something like, um, whether it's biodegradability standards or extended producer responsibility or certain incentives to capture waste methane gas, all these sorts of things, or, or um, changes to like regional manufacturing or keeping things local. Any sort of this, whether it's some sort of legislation or other sort of government incentive could be huge for us. However, we're not, we've never banked on that in the past and we're not anticipating that going forward, but it is something that we could really jumpstart manufacturing, whether it's in the state of California or some other uh, location internationally. I'd, I'd love to hear thoughts from all of you about the innovation ecosystem, particularly in California and around the Stanford community, but more broadly, what are the unique things that have enabled this place to be so vibrant? And, and what are the lessons that need to be taken up around the world? And I don't know, Terry, you wanna start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I guess um, one thing is, you know, just really uh, keeping a finger on the pulse of what's happening with private capital. Um, and I think that the head of our R&D division has done a fantastic job about staying up to date with what's happening in Silicon Valley and elsewhere across the state. And then really looking to fill the gaps um, for, you know, say riskier investments, kind of less sexy technologies, things that, you know, maybe aren't as popular amongst the VC and other funding communities. Uh, one other point I'd like to say is, you know, we are a, a <laughs> large state um, and a really diverse state. And so, um, another thing that I'm proud of with our R&D work is that we have hubs across the state, um, including Central Valley, Northern California, Southern California, to really foster entrepreneurship um, in all pockets and regions of the state. Um, and to really prioritize uh, supporting entrepreneurs who represent California. So that means, you know, women, uh, people of color, people of all different types of backgrounds, veterans, um, you know, so really just trying to, to support as diverse of an ecosystem as possible. Molly, your take on the, on the ecosystem issue? Yeah, so this is something I find really interesting and I think quite a bit about. So the tech, basic foundational technology, the scientific inspiration for mango materials was actually part of my PhD work at Stanford University. It came out of the lab of Sarah Billington and Craig Criddle in civil and environmental engineering. And I can guarantee that this would not have happened somewhere else. And our company wouldn't have gotten off the ground if we were in a different location. And we get this question from investors all the time, like you're in the San Francisco Bay area, it's so expensive, like can't you be somewhere else? And my answer to that is right now at the stage our technology is definitely not. We need to be here where these new radical kind of maniac ideas are, are seen as normal, they're seen as typical, and this risk is rewarded. However, our technology is biomanufacturing. We take waste methane gas, we feed that to bacteria, and we produce a plastic replacement. This is manufacturing, and often the people who really truly get what we do are often in places like the Midwest, like rural farmers often instantly get what we do. So we, we get that question, like why aren't you in you know, the hog farms of- Nebraska. Carolina, yeah, exactly. And I think there are reasons why we really should be there first. And we're looking for a site for our full commercial plant right now, which is still in the future. I'd love to keep it in California if I could, but there might be incentives to be located elsewhere. So to start off that technology when it's new, when you're trying to find the product market fit and you're trying to scale it up and you need engineers who can think about things completely differently or you want to make polymers on Mars, like being in the San Francisco Bay Area is a unique ec ecosystem. But once you're actually building your factory, is, is this the best place to have that first factory? Um, I'm, I'm less certain about that. And, and Ken, it seems like one of the 
key pieces of, of glue in this whole thing is the availability of venture funding, startup funding from groups like yours. And, and do you find something special about being in the Bay Area? I do. And I think, Chris, you know, one thing that comes to mind, you know, certainly funding is an important part of the mix, but um, just taking a step back, we do stand kind of on the shoulders of, of um, past work that's been done by the federal government and by national labs and by colleges and universities to really um, sponsor um, R&D work that helps to create, that's helped to create such a vibrant ecosystem. Um, so places like the three national labs that we have here in the Bay Area um, at, at Berkeley, at Stanford, and, and at, at Livermore um, are, are great centers um, that, that continue in terms of helping, uh, helping this innovation ecosystem for, for a number of decades. Um, on top of that, um, that enabling environment connects into other factors like uh, great talent that we have coming out of uh, the colleges, colleges and universities in this area, as well as then on top of that, having places like Sand Hill Road that are um, a source of, of funding. Now, uh, startups and, and entrepreneurs in this space have a lot of other sectors that um, may be, that, that are kind of eyeing them. And it, it can be hard to keep people squarely focused in the, um, in the clean energy sector. Um, so that's maybe one of the challenges that we have as as investors is hoping to create that enabling environment. But, um, you know, all told, this is, you know, a fantastic place to, um, you know, to, to be getting one start as an entrepreneur. And one of the challenges with energy and clean tech is that it scales differently than a lot of the typical tech industries. And you can't really imagine doing heavy manufacturing or electricity production just in Silicon Valley. And what are your thoughts about the ingredients we need in order to have the, the mix and the idealism and the innovation here uh, equally relevant in the, in the middle of the US, in the South, in, in Africa and South America? This needs to be a, a global innovation enterprise. Yeah, um, agreed. And, and I, I think that, yeah, th this, absolutely needs to be a global enterprise. This needs to be a set of activities that take place in all, all parts of the country. I think that, you know, just getting back to this point on having, um, you know, really great support from government and, and uh, other forms of uh, capital that can take risks and not necessarily need return on their capital. Um, I think that's, that's incredibly vital. Um, I, Prior to this role, I spent um, four years working at the U.S. Department of Energy in programs like the uh, loan program at the, the DOE, which helped to fund some of the first uh, large-scale solar plants in the, in the U.S., uh, for example. You know, that, that was capital that ended up um, ultimately creating an industry that's seen great returns. But uh, at the time, it was, those were the types of plants that banks would not want to fund on their own. So I think just examples like that of having, whether it's governments, whether it's nonprofits and foundations, um, other NGOs that, that can um, step in and play that role, that can be incredibly helpful in creating that, that enabling environment. And we are in a uniquely challenging time now with the pandemic. I, I wonder, Molly, how you see the pathway out of the pandemic is either making your mission more or less complicated. Do you see some opportunities at the same time they're challenges? I do, I see, well, I'm a per perpetual glass half full person, um, but so I do see opportunities here. I think now's the time for science, now's the time for biology. I think that those are the solutions to the pandemic and also potential solutions to the recovery. So I see our mission or our path forward um, is really being aligned with the, the recovery. Like maybe there will be new financing options. You know, uh, we do need infrastructure to build our factories at the site of waste methane. You know, I think it was Sarah who was mentioning that 
um, maybe certain sorts of technologies like these aren't sexy for venture capitalists. And I think certain aspects of them can be, but yeah, we, we meet very few investors who are excited about funding a $500,000 centrifuge. So um, if there are unique solutions, you know, we're a first of its kind biotechnology plant. This isn't something that's already existing that we're replicating. So if there's unique financial incentives, I think that could really help a company like mine potentially scale faster have more diverse ac ac um, access to different forms of capital that could help us with our manufacturing. Maybe we could even stay in the San Francisco Bay Area or in California or in the US and not some other country. Not that I'm opposed to some other country because I think the whole world needs solutions like ours. But if we can start locally and then through a partnering model, uh, expand and scale up our technology around the world, I think that could be beneficial. So I know there's been a lot of talk around biotechnology and things like that. And I think that, um, well, you know, this COVID-19, this is a, an enormous travesty, but one of the benefit, I mean, I hate to say that there's any benefits about it, but this is something where you can see the externalities of what's happening. Something like climate change and plastic pollution is much harder to understand and much more longer term. I, I do believe science is going to get us out of this pandemic at some point, hopefully sooner than longer, but things like plastics in the ocean and climate change, these are very long-term problems that unfortunately are not going to go away. So I'm trying to veer my company ship in the same direction I was headed and just doing whatever I can to make sure I'm still hitting those targets. And Tara, one of the things we're hearing is that maybe as we come out of the lockdown associated with the pandemic, we ought to go with the traditional stuff that we know how to do and, and not worry about trying to bring new things online. And that the, maybe even though we didn't necessarily think that before, that maybe the old ways are going to be the best. How do you push back against that to really continue to advance the agenda for a clean energy future? Well, I do. I agree with Molly that, you know, if there is a silver lining um, of this pandemic. I mean, maybe it is to kind of rethink the way we're doing some things, um, whether that means teleworking opportunities, uh, you know, shifting family dynamics. I mean, you know, across, uh, you know, both social and uh, kind of infrastructure realms. Um, one thing that does give me hope is the clean air above the LA basin. Um, and I do, you know, hope that we can see this as an opportunity to achieve these types of pollution reductions without crashing GDP by, you know, looking at switching to electrification of vehicles to achieve the same results while still supporting a thriving economy. Um, and so, you know, I think that there hopefully will be opportunities, especially with stimulus funding coming to uh, put people to work, to rethink, you know, some of our infrastructure. Um, and I mean, frankly, I think across clean energy, a lot of the low hanging fruit is, is done. We've done it. Um, and so now some of the challenges that we're facing, thinking about electrifying our building and transportation stock, um, thinking about, you know, the future of our natural gas system, these are massive infrastructure projects that are going to require a lot of funding and will produce a lot of jobs. Uh, and, you know, I think will result in a higher quality of life for Californians and serve as a, a model for the rest of the country and the world. So I do hope that we can leverage this moment. Um, for those of you who have been watching Governor Newsom's uh, daily briefings, you know, I hope we can meet this moment um, and, and really just leverage out into the future. Great, thanks so much. I, I want to transition to questions from all of you in the audience in just about two minutes. So if you have not yet submitted your questions in the chat window, please go ahead and do that. Uh, Molly, let me just swing back to this question of scaling and the, the issue of, you know, do you see um, us being in a world where we're trying to move away from plastics or is this a world where we need a whole wide range of new kinds of materials to basically do everything from serving the need for plastic bags to, to houses and, and uh, you know, structural elements, pavement. Yeah, so I see both. First off, we see a lot of brands right now, specifically brands that are talking with their consumers, 
that want to be either plastic free or low or less plastic. So um, a lot of people, especially in the environmental sector, are seeing plastic as a dirty word. So we actually say we don't, we don't do plastics. We don't call what we do a bioplastic. We call it a biopolymer or a plastic replacement. So there's a little bit of a marketing language communication thing going on there. And um, that being said, I think the world does need lots of solutions. I think, you know, um, we're, we're actually seeing some unique things going on right now with some pushbacks of things like um, plastic bag bans in San Francisco and, and other places like that, where, oh, this is, it kind of goes back to what Tara was saying again, like this is the tried and true, this is the safe hygienic material. We have these single use disposable plastics. We've never seen oil be so cheap and virgin plastic be so cheap. And the manufacturing facilities, the MRFs are, are struggling right now. So the price of recycled resin is, is, is high and virgin plastic is low. So I think we need a lot of solutions, whether it's take back programs, whether it's durables for certain applications, whether it's materials such as ours that can be either backyard composted or could be biodegraded if they end up in um, environments where they shouldn't be polluting or persistent. But also we need to look at where polyethylene, where PVC, where polypropylene, where these materials really should be and where's their highest and best use and then have solutions uh, depending on, on what we're doing. And one last question before I go to the to the written questions from the audience. It, Ken, it, it's already been clear in the comments from all three of the panelists that a lot of what needs to happen is we need bold new innovations in areas that we haven't even thought of. And I wonder as a as an innovation supporter, how you think about encouraging people to look over the horizon and then how when people are coming from over the horizon, you tell whether or not they're wacko or not. <laughs> yeah, well, we need, we, we need big dreams in the space. And something that I've always tried to do is to encourage our organization and the places that I've worked to be very inclusive of people that are thinking on, on really any time scale, uh, whether it's a very immediate time scale or, or thinking 10, year, 10 years plus, uh, you know, those, this is, we're, I think we're all working towards um, thinking about what are the solutions that we're going to need to meet a net zero target in 2050. And there are technologies that are not yet um, feasible today, but they may be feasible uh, down the road. And, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's really the type of thinking we need is, is a multi-decade approach. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a bit of a challenge in an investment and funding landscape because um, some funding uh, that we put forward, we, we're obligated to think about how can this be built and scaled in the next, uh, over the next several years, a, several years to, to, to five years. But uh, I think if there's something that we can't fund, we, we try to provide other points of connection and, and resources so that, um, you know, maybe there are other opportunities for something that we may not be able to fund, but it's able to, they're able to tie to a, a researcher or a, um, a source of risk cap, uh, risk capital that's, that's not us that, that can help to buy them additional uh, time to, to work on their, their idea. So I think in, in short, Chris, yeah, um, you know, no idea is, uh, is to, uh, you know, outside of the, bounds right now because we really need everybody that's creative and smart and and uh you know committed to the space um you know all hands on deck great okay i'm going to transition now to questions from the audience i i have a, a bunch they're all interesting here's one from mary how do panelists see the green new deal is fitting into the political discussion around pandemic recovery and stimulus molly green new deal yeah, I think it's really interesting. I'd love to see that be part of it. Um, I do see it being very co controversial. I think we've had some politicians sort of discussing that as well. I mean, you could imagine a world in, with the recovery or even now incentives to certain technologies or certain companies like, oh, if, you know, if the airlines are being bailed out, is there an incentive for ones if they make certain commitments to certain types of fuels or something like that? I, I think you could imagine a world, and I, I'm very optimistic that we could have something like that. But you see 
massive political backlash going on right now with that. Um, so kind of like I mentioned before, it's something I would personally love to see as the CEO of Mango Materials. I would love to see it. At the same time, I'm not 100% counting on it. And, and Tara, how do you think about where you might expect to see stimulus funding especially? And would it be more helpful if it was in the form of a Green New Deal or like a major infrastructure package? Yeah, I mean, I think any opportunity we have, um, again, to think about not just rebuilding our economy, but rebuilding it better. Um, you know, we need to be forward looking right now, not just thinking about the next six months, but, you know, be looking out 50 years. Um, and, you know, I think just as a proxy, you know, the idea of after hurricanes, you know, we tend to rebuild our homes and infrastructure exactly the same way. And you hear about neighborhoods and cities that, you know, are just decimated over and over and over again, because nothing has changed. And I think this is an example of that type of thinking on a massive scale. And, you know, I hope we can look to the precedent that uh, ARA funding set to really help kickstart, you know, the large scale renewable industry, um, you know, which was successful in a lot of ways. Um, so hopefully I think we can take some lessons learned from there um, and just be smart about the money that we're putting back into our economy. That's great. Uh, Ken, I, I want to follow up with a slightly different question that also speaks to this question of, of stimulus funds. And Anders says, it seems that VC investments in climate tech have not grown proportionally to the size of the problem. And it, is there a way that VC funds should be um, aligned better with whatever stimulus is coming from the government? Yeah, well, I think on that question, Chris, uh, Having signals from the government of um, being able to provide stimulus, I think is example of Tara just mentioned of the ARA funding, which came out of the last, uh, out of the Great Recession and helped to jumpstart a new boom in this space. Um, you know, those types of signals from the government can be a great signal in turn to investors and people that are raising funds that, um, th that a, a new opportunity is, is going to emerge that will have um, early capital that, that doesn't necessarily need a return and could be complemented by venture capital, which does, does need returns and, and uh, has a, uh, you know, some very specific uh, time horizon uh, requirements to it. So I'd like to see both. Um, I, I'd like to see the, the uh, you know, hopefully the government piece continue to increase. You know, on that previous question about the Green New Deal, um, you know, any sort of policy debate that helps to elevate climate and the role of, of clean energy in our economy, I think is, you know, if it's done thoughtfully, is a very positive thing because this is, we're in a space that can get a little bit lost um, here. But uh, um, so I, I do want to see that continue to, to take place. And then, you know, I, I think the venture hopefully will continue to, to follow, but um, it's it, it is a it's a tricky space. This is this is a space that needs many forms of capital, not just venture. It needs to have a, a whole mix to um, align with the uh, you know range of time uh, horizons that we have for the various technologies that we're going to need to meet our our goals. Great. Let me let me um, switch more to questions about what each of us can do to play our part. Is a question. Uh, problem, maybe for Tara, are there things ordinary people can do to help promote renewable energy use? It's a, it's a good question and it's challenging. Um, you know, I think the standard responses are, you know, try to put solar in your house, switch to, you know, high efficiency uh, light bulbs and technologies in your home. Um, but I mean, I think talking to the Stanford community, um, you know, maybe a more appropriate response is work in the field. Um, and, you know, especially in government, we need people who are committed to this cause. And my boss, uh, Chair Hochschild, really loves to use the term fire in the belly. You know, we're looking for, uh, you know, people with all types of skill sets and backgrounds to help us, you know, fight this fight, because it is still an uphill battle. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need creative thinking. Um, 
And, and there are a lot of opportunities um, to, you know, maybe not spend your entire career in the public sector, um, but engage with policy, understand what's happening, um, you know, with regulations too. It's, you know, maybe not as um, catchy and alluring as things like the Green New Deal, but things like building efficiency standards and appliance standards. I mean, that's what's really driven energy reductions in California. Um, and so, you know, at least try to engage with government to the extent possible. Um, and, you know, I hope especially current students think about careers in the public sector, or at least getting a couple of years experience. So in 2020, it's really, really important to have a job. And it's even more important to have a job that you feel good about when you come home at the end of the day. <laughs> um, it, here's, a, here's a question uh, about about the pandemic uh, from Apollo. During the current pandemic, a number of people are telecommuting. Is there a possibility that companies might consider that telecommuting part-time or full-time for some of their workers might actually be a feasible and attractive alternative in the future? And I'd be interested to know what how each of you feels about telecommuting as you've been doing it over the last several weeks. I'm happy to, to jump in. So, you know, I, I think this has been such an interesting time in terms, as we think about the future of work um, and, and, and uh, telecommuting, I think that um, there's been such, there's been so many different views that have been expressed in the past about whether people need to be available in person to do the best work and, and collaborate or whether that can be replaced by telecommuting. I think that we've seen that the um, technologies that can bring us together are much more robust than we might have realized in the past. And we're also quite adapt. It, we're doing a great job, I think, of adapting to, you know, things like Zoom, where we may have had a in-person, uh, you know, conference in the past. Uh, so I, I think just, you know, seeing the range of technologies that can um, help people from all different parts of the globe come together. Um, there, there's some strengths to that that um, you know, may not have been present before when we were rushing to catch the train and commute an hour back and forth to to jobs and and kind of losing that time, not necessarily having time with uh, with family and at, and at home as as much as we would like to. So, I just like that it's it's given us a you know if if there is a silver you know one other potential silver lining is it's given us another perspective on you know what it might be like to to telecommute and, and working that into our, our bag of potential yeah. um, you know, work options. I, I think for me, probably the most important lesson from the sheltering in place experience, it isn't necessarily about telecommuting, it's that it's worth thinking about things, doing things differently because exactly. you may be able to come up with a better way to do it. Yes. Other thoughts on the telecommuting in particular? Mm -hmm. Molly, Tara? Yeah, I found it interesting. Um, I actually do have historically telecommuted, but I travel historically. I've traveled a ton for work. I go into the lab. I go to our field test site routinely historically. So now only working from home. So I think I'm one of the few people that actually did a fair amount of Zoom meetings before this began. But the one thing I found interesting is in the transition to all the Zoom meetings, I've had more Zoom meetings like a video chats with people that I historically haven't. So I, I gave a, a couple of interviews recently, just, just like this, where I was talking to the person in, in Europe about plastics or whatever. And historically, I'd always do those um, just with my ear, just audio, no visual. And it really is different one-on-one -on -one talking to the journalists like this. And I, you know, I could see them, I could see their physical response. It was really different. Like at the end of the hour session, I felt like we were friends. Um, whereas even though I would have had that same discussion, I would have given the same responses verbally there's something about actually seeing the person that was very similar, probably not as good as if we were physically at an event together, but it was pretty darn close. And, you know, when they're in Europe, God, it was so much easier. So I think it is really interesting how things could, um, could change. A lot of our work that we do couldn't, couldn't, a, a lot of my workers couldn't telecommute long, long term. Um, but some of, some of us could. So I think there are some things that are changing. It's something I've always been intrigued about. I believe, I believe it was Google who didn't really allow much working from home because they did a bunch of analysis and realized people weren't as productive. Um, and I think there are some reasons for that, but it's something I'm very fascinated with. And I'm a huge proponent of like, what can we learn from this? Are we doing things the best way? 
anyway, like I, I love learning new things. We're going to transition to the Dennis Hayes video in about two more minutes, but I would love to hear a short comment from each of you it's reflected in a question about, even though this is before you were born, how do you think about Earth Day in 2020 as addressing different issues and different possibilities than Earth Day in 1970? Terry, you want to start? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess one way that I would say it's different is that energy is so ingrained in everything that we do now. You know, I think um, in previous decades, you know, thinking about energy was kind of a siloed topic. Um, but now, I mean, talking about social issues, the future of work, innovation, transportation, I mean, everything is kind of coming together. Um, and I think, you know, just maybe thinking more holistically about these issues, trying to break down silos between sectors um, and just ensuring that the, the solutions that we're working toward really are comprehensive and systemic and kind of all fit together. Great. And? I think that um, as, you know, two things come to mind, Chris. You know, one is that, you know, we're all stewards of the earth. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we, we have somewhat limited time here. And so there's kind of an opportunity for us to continue to think about how we can, you know, leave this place better than we found it. Um, so that, that's one, one piece. And I, I think another piece, you know, just thinking forward with Earth Day is how to continue to make Earth Day and, and this movement, you know, as inclusive to everybody as, as possible. You know, let's remember that this is, a, that, that the things that we're working on really need to be, um, you know, try and need to be things that, that try to help, um, you know, all communities, you know, regardless of, of geography. Excellent. Thank you. And Molly. Yeah. So the very last trip I went on before the pandemic was with my family and we went to Redwood National Park in Northern California. And you can go back almost a hundred years there to the logging and other things that were happening a, a long time ago and see that there were these little ideas that I think have really um, catalyzed this movement over, over the decades. So I wasn't alive in 1970, 50 years ago, but I do think I have a feeling of the spirit and what was trying to be done to protect the environment from so many different points of view back then. I don't know how much, you know, people were looking at polluting plastics back then. I'm sure some people were, but now these things have really gone mainstream. I was talking to my children this morning about Earth Day and just how there's so many different things to think about in terms of how the environment touches us every day. And I do think, um, I hope, you know, this is finally finally getting its moment. And, and, you know, I always joke that sort of every day is Earth Day, but how can we take this energy, this momentum, this focus on biology and the planet and, and, and protect it and pass it on to future generations? I love the concept that every day is Earth Day. What I'd like to do now is transition to another conversation, but one that's a little more Stanford-based with a Stanford faculty member who was active at Original Earth Day. And in order to keep the set of voices diverse, the uh, next panelist will be interviewed by Olivia Ames. Olivia is a junior at Stanford majoring in political science. Her academic interests are in comparative politics and environmental policy, especially related to environmental justice and grassroots mobilization. Olive has also been a leader in Stanford Farmers, a student-led group promoting community involvement in the campus, farm to connect people to their food systems through experiential learning. And she'll be interviewing Perry McCarty. Perry is the Silas H. Palmer Professor of Civil Engineering Emeritus at Stanford, where he's been on the faculty since 1962. Perry is in many ways the founder of modern environmental engineering, both at Stanford and around the world. His work on using biological processes to control contaminants has been recognized with, among other many honors, including election to the National Academy of Engineering and the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. And uh, really central to our conversation today, Perry was an active leader in environmental scholarship at the first Earth Day in 1970. Olivia, Perry, I'm turning it over to you. Good afternoon, Professor McCarty. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. <laughs> And so the first thing we wanted to start with was just asking a little bit more about your experience of the first Earth Day at in 1970 at Stanford. 
We also heard you did a little bit of the earliest tabling in Stanford at White Plaza for Stanford people. So we'd love to hear about that as well. Well, uh, as Dennis Hayes um, indicated, the um, Earth Day in 1970 was um, a response uh, to the, the Vietnam War, Vietnam War uh, crisis that was students were protesting all over the country. Um, Stanford had it, many of its windows were knocked out and filled with the plaster, with uh, just, uh, so that we couldn't see through them and so forth. Um, so Earth Day 1970 was such a, then a glorious coming together of students from all disciplines. Um, something for a change was uniting us rather than uh, dividing us. I'd like to um, indicate uh, some of the what happened, and certainly Earth Day uh, 1970 uh, bloomed from an increased uh, public awareness that um, of the faculty, of the uh, people throughout the United States, of the many, many threats that were coming uh, from uh, environmental problems. And I'd like to just talk about a few of those. Uh, for example, 1950, uh, refractory synthetic organic, something new in the environment, uh, was reaching uh, water supplies and treatment plants. When I came to Stanford, uh, San Jose had just built its first uh, reclamation plant, sewage treatment plant, and uh, outside, and the foam built up about 15 feet tall, was blowing all around the neighborhoods. Uh, groundwater's contamination, groundwater downstream from septic tanks was um, becoming. Um, Whenever people draw it out, the foam would just bubble. Chinook, Kansas, 1956, had one of our first really droughts. Uh, the stream dried up. And so to get water supplied for the people, they put a dam downstream of the wastewater treatment plant. The water went up to the water from the wastewater treatment plant to the water treatment plant. And um, so people were drinking that. And when you looked at the head of the drinking water, it looked like it was a nice glass of beer with a big foam on top of it, but it certainly didn't taste like beer. Um, 1950, Hogg and Smith um, made a discovery that the smog, the terrible smog that was going on in Los Angeles was coming not from uh, factories and so forth, but from automobiles and the photochemical smog he defined was the source, which is a big breakthrough there. Uh, 1956, the Minamata disease in, uh, in Japan um, ended up with uh, many crippled children uh, from eating fish that was contaminated with the methylmercury, a new episode there, which sort of was very surprising. But when we started looking around the United States, the chloral alkali plants here in California and mercury mining and so forth, we found it was not just there, but it was here then. It was 1958 that uh, Charles Keeling, Charles Keeling began, became concerned about what was happening to all the fossil fuel we were burning and um, started measuring the CO2 on Mauna Lea and in Hawaii, CO2 build up in the atmosphere and was showing it rapidly increasing. And he called at that time about talking about the really the club climate Climate, the warming climate that was being result. So that was back then, 1958. 1960, the Public Health Service detected uh, chlorinated solvents and other chemicals in groundwater and raised a very strong concern about that. Of course, nothing was done. 1962, Rachel Carson came out with her Silent Spring and indicating that the organic chlorinated pesticides we were using was causing devastation impacts on the the on the uh, egrets, uh, you know, pelicans, and and the eagles. So um, Paul Ehrlich then in 1968, that's when he came out with his book on uh, on uh, the the uh, on the population bomb talking about the impact it's having on our resources that we didn't have enough. And here, 50 years later, what do we got now? 
it's more than doubled the population, more than doubled since then. The world's population more than double that. California's population more than double that. And so resources are becoming much more and scarce as we go along. Now, I don't know if uh, anyone can see Mike. Do you see me on the picture? Okay. Yes. This is uh, 19, six, 1970 when we had Earth Day. Our students were interested in water, wastewater. And here is a picture that we put up. I don't know if you can see that. Yep. Um, but it uh, wow. was looking, that here we have one of those students dressed up as Uncle Sam here um, in a costume, sitting on the toilet and indicating this is a resource. Because as we've come along, what we've seen then and now we're seeing so much is that all our wastes, what we call wastes, are resources. And because of the great resource deficiency, we have to recycle it. So that was to promote at that time, back in 1970, that we look at wastewater is not a waste. It's a, a very valuable source of water. And uh, that is what, um, what is uh, happening now. So we, um, after that time, I just wanted to show that um, we started moving in uh, quite the right direction. And um, I think we started started so much, 1970 was really the start when we started putting a lot of our efforts into controlling these and many other environmental pollutions. Thank you for that photo, that, that was really incredible. Um, you've noted uh, in your answer a couple of the things that were the impetus for the Earth Day on on campus, but something I'm also curious about is what do you think have been some of the biggest positive changes with regard to the environment and the environmental movement over the last 50 years? Well, the um, it's actually has been incredible, the changes in almost all of the areas that I indicated there. We, I think we recognized them back then. So many of the problems we're still talking about or have talked about or have been corrected or worked on. We have clean waters, clean streams, much more so than we had back then, which is a terrific, uh, terrific advantage. One of the things that we didn't realize then, which I think was uh, kind of interesting, it was in, oh, it was in until 1974, so four days after, the Cherry Roland and Marino, Mario Molina uh, discovered the impact of chlorofluorocarbons use in refrigeration and so forth. And they predicted this, that it was going up into the, value, the valuable ozone layer that we had in the, in the stratosphere and was destroying it. That was so important at that time. And it was only 13 later, years later that the Montreal Protocol, a world getting together realizing a problem that had been identified, not something we saw, but was identified 1987, the Marine Protocol, and it made such a huge difference. And those, along with Paul Crutzen, uh, who worked on this problem in 1995, received the Nobel Prize. I think that's astounding, one of the most astounding parts I've ever seen. But the, the, what the process of being made was significant. Yeah, and I think something interesting that we're also curious about is 50 years later, if you uh, were a student, as you were, uh, what would you choose to study or focus on? Or what would you tell young students, whether they're in high school or college, to focus on if they're interested in the environment and sustainability? There are so many, um, there are so many problems that you can work on, but I, I might say, of course, the uh, the biggest really the biggest problem we have now has been worked on and so forth is is uh, what uh, is the climate change we've been moving that sign but it is so much yet to do so far to go and it, people from all walks of life uh, need to focus on that so I I'd say that is the the major thing we want to do. Still, there's a lot of other ones, so, and it takes working together. So many of these problems have to require people from many different disciplines coming together. And I think that is a, a big change. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great end point. Um, thank you so much, that was really- I have one, can I say one more thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. If I got time. 
Um, I just want to, one thing you asked about students and so forth and going forward and so forth. I always, way back then, uh, Rene Dubo was a biologist um, and um, I was always impressed that he'd made four, some statements. One is, uh, one of the statements he made of four words he's, he always talked about is for people to think globally, act locally. And I think for when you talk about what should everybody do, it's not just the scientists and the engineers, but everybody by looking, seeing a big problem, environmental problem, and seeing what can I do about it locally. It's always something that can be done. And if people always work together, that'll, that'll, that's what we need. The other thing he said in another talk was uh, trend is not destiny. Trend is not destiny. So we're seeing these problems. We see many problems, and um, what he's saying, what he's saying is, if we see the problems, then we should work and cause it to bend over. By seeing it, we can change it, and it's not destiny for us, but we should all work together and solve it. I think it's those two statements are very useful for everyone to remember. Thank you, Professor Ricardi. Thank you, and thank, and you. thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Perry, so much. We're extremely fortunate this afternoon to be able to hear clothing thoughts from Mark Tessie Levine, Mark Tessie Levine's pioneering neuroscientist, biotechnology executive, and academic leader who has, since September of 2016, served as the 11th president of Stanford University. You know, all of us who work at Stanford have been so grateful for Mark's steady hand in these challenging times, but also for his passionate focus on Stanford's potential to make the world a better place. Mark. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and, and thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, and good afternoon to all of you. I'm delighted to join you for a few minutes uh, at the end of this wonderful event. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be here uh, earlier. I was able to catch uh, the last wonderful discussion uh, between Olivia and Perry, uh, but I uh, otherwise had to be at a trustee meeting. Uh, I really wish we could be together in person, uh, but I am so glad that so many of us could gather virtually today. We really are living through strange times. Um, one thing that has struck me is how being quarantined uh, is changing my relationship with nature, how important it is now to get outside, to walk, to exercise, to think, uh, things that I took for granted before, but that have become much more present uh, and much more important. Uh, it's really reinforced my gratitude for the natural world um, as a source of calm and a place for deep thinking and also a place for reconnecting with people, uh, even if we're just waving at a distance. And, and so it feels especially fitting to celebrate the earth and our environment right now. Um, and I was so pleased and proud that the Woods Institute convened this event to kick off Earth Week. Uh, I also want to celebrate Stanford's special connection with um, Earth Day through Dennis Hayes, organizer of the first Earth Day and a Stanford graduate who spoke earlier today, Dennis. I'm so grateful you were able to join us for today's celebration. Now, you'll recall that thousands of people at universities, at schools, uh, and in uh, communities uh, across the country celebrated the first Earth Day. They peacefully demonstrated for greater environmental protections, and in doing so, they created the modern environmental movement. 50 years after the first Earth Day, Stanford is committed to ensuring a sustainable future from taking steps to improve sustainability on our own campus to contributing to the scholarship and solutions that will help address the challenge of climate change and other environmental issues. One of the goals set out in Stanford's long range vision is to produce enough renewable electricity every year to offset our annual electricity consumption. And we'll actually achieve this goal next year when our second solar power generating plant goes online. Uh, when combined with our existing solar generating systems, this plant will also allow Stanford to achieve an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from their peak uh, by 2025, so 80% reduction. We're constructing new buildings and upgrading older buildings to meet strict energy use guidelines and exploring many other ideas to improve ca campus sustainability, uh, including focusing on uh, equipment and vehicles and making sure that we electrify them. Um, our hope is that some of the solutions devised for our campus can also be a model for other, how other universities and businesses can reach their own sustainability goals. 
Uh, Stanford students, Stanford faculty, Stanford staff are actively engaged in research and innovation that will help build a sustainable relationship with our planet. Scholars from across our community have done tremendous work that's help us, helped us understand our planet, our energy resources, our changing climate, and more. Uh, one example is the Natural Capital Project, or NatCap, a network of academics, software engineers, and real-world professionals at more than 50 research institutions and 200 implementing partners worldwide. Uh, NatCap is focused on delivering the best scientific knowledge and tools to incorporate the value of natural capital and ecosystem services into decision-making in the real world. And building on leading initiatives here at Stanford like NatCap, like the Center for Ocean Solutions, like the Global Freshwater Initiative, and many others, our university's long-range vision now seeks to expand our focus and impact with the launch of a sustainability accelerator, with the goal of reaching beyond our campus to develop innovative, sustainable solutions and scale them for the world. I want to close by saying a few words about our current crisis. The coronavirus pandemic has made it abundantly clear how important it is that we are guided by science in policymaking and crisis response. It's also highlighted how interconnected our world is and how critical cross-border scholarship is to addressing global challenges. I think we all recognize that the pandemic will have far-reaching consequences and leave a lasting impact on our society. Our world will be different when this is over in ways large and small. And as difficult as this crisis will be, we will also learn a great deal about our inter interconnected world, about our innate social needs, and about the opportunities and challenges associated with online learning, remote work, and virtual events like this one. And it'll, it'll be up to us um, to consider how we can take these lessons and use them to make our world better, and also in the process to improve the health of our planet as well. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much, Chris, for the kind invitation to be here. I hope you've enjoyed the afternoon and I hope that you will enjoy us for our other events this Earth Week. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mark, for uh, really encouraging words in, in a challenging time. Thanks to all of the panelists for a really illuminating picture of where we need to go and the deep resources, personally, interpersonally, institutionally that we can all draw on. I'd like to, to close the event with a thought about the positive theme that we've seen and to also recognize that there are way more opportunities than we have begun to capitalize and that taking advantage of those is really the motivation for having institutions like Stanford and I'd like to transition to a, a new video that features students that really capture this sense of optimism. So thanks so much for joining us. Hello and happy Earth Day. Every day is Earth Day to some extent. I'm here in my garden. In my parents' beautiful backyard. I'm in Maryland on a tributary to the Chesapeake Bay. I'm speaking to you from home and I'm fortunate to live along the main creek that flows through the Stanford campus. I'm currently in the Waterwise Garden on campus, uh, which illustrates a variety of different plants from different native locations that can grow in the California climate and how they can be managed using clever water management. Earth Day 1970 was a great awakening in the environmental movement in a way that had never happened before. Millions of people came together to make it clear that they care and they're willing to work. In 2020 and beyond, it's so important for us to carry on that spirit and that commitment. The two things that give me the most hope are interacting with nature, whether it's outside, in my garden, or in a park, and interacting with students. Teaching virtually over Zoom, I have confidence with every student I interact with that the earth is in good hands. Well, and I just grew up kind of immersed in the outdoors and it became sort of a home for me, something grounding very peaceful and important for my mental health and for my physical health and in my use of the environment through my outdoor activities I also really try to think of myself as a steward and try and be aware of the ways that my use impacts the world. For me the coronavirus pandemic emphasizes interconnectedness. Its rapid spread around the world reflects the fact that humans are a global species but it also emphasizes the interconnectedness between humans and nature. 
virus jump human from a wild animal host. That jump, perhaps more than anything else, proves that the human enterprise is deeply connected to the natural world. The resilience of communities in light of COVID-19 shows that our global community can come together to fight a shared threat. And though we still face challenges, immense challenges with COVID-19 and all the socioeconomic fallout associated with it, it shows that we can talk to one another and make progress in the face of immense international challenges. It's been a reminder of how powerless human systems can be. But at the same time, uh, American society and many other places around the world I've really resolved to take an economic hit to protect the most vulnerable. And that gives me hope that we can come together as humanity to protect not just the most vulnerable, but really everyone who will be addressed by climate change. Without a doubt, sheltering in place provides an extra opportunity to think and learn, but it also provides an extra opportunity to do.